locus selection so how do you select the locus so by the way locus is nothing but the, the region in the genome that you would like to amplify and further sequence and analyze it right to reconstruct the phylogeny or for you routinely used in dna barcoding isn't it so loci is the the plural locus is a single so which locus to to choose right should i choose which one so uh, that is that you know that is a conundrum that is basically the problem uh, faced by most of the molecular geneticists as well as dna barcoding you know if you are attempting to do a dna barcoding if you don't know uh, for example a plant you don't know uh, which plant is that or if you're confused that it belongs to this or that or you suspect that this plant to be a new species you would like to barcode with a standard barcoding region right that is called locus so how do you select it by the way this is how the normal workflow in the phylogeny or phylogenetics first you select choose a locus then you need to design the primer or you choose a uh, generic primer which has already been designed by somebody else then amplify it and then sequence it dna sequencing sanger sequencing usually uh, not the next gen you know sanger sequencing is preferred because the read length is very long you know and then the next step is to assemble these short reads it's basically sanger sequencing work on two direction both the direction you know, this bi-direction sequencing right and then uh, each direction will uh, will just stop in between it will not be like if it's a, a 1200 uh, base you know there is 1.2 kb is the length of the dna stretch so the forward primer will amplify some and it will stop somewhere around 700 reverse primer will also stop somewhere around 700 why 700 because there is a read length you know so that itself is a really good because that is it's an old technology sanger sequencing and the read length is again proportional to the capillary it's basically a capillary sequence it's a electrophoresis you know the sequencing is nothing but uh, gel electrophoresis but here it is capillary electrophoresis so the capillary length if it's a long capillary then you're going to get a long read length if you're going for a short capillary you will get short read length right so once you have these two things you need to assemble to assemble you need to see the overlapping region so if there is no overlap you cannot assemble it that is what a quantic assembly is all about right so uh, for example you have a, a map of india political map with the different uh, you know different state in different colors and if you just cut it very very uh, haphazardly you know awkwardly you cut it everything and then you try to assemble again how do you do that by looking at uh, the pattern and looking at the same color isn't it like a jigsaw puzzle so you need some kind of reference so that is why you need to have an overlap and once you assemble it you can read from starting till the end to make the one complete stretch of the locus there is a gene that is called consensus sequence so once you have consensus sequence then uh, you can of course you can submit it to the gen bank and you can also retrieve the generate you know the uh, related sequences from the gen bank that is the next step you know so before submitting to the gen bank like bank it and other tools your own genius you can use directly to submit you need to annotate properly you know annotate like if you take a, a pdf uh, article annotation means you are underlying and you're marking some side thing right that is physically we are doing this annotation and in the dna sequence the annotation is which one is basically the gene which is not a gene and if it's a eukaryote you can say like this is an intron you know so this is an exon this is a coding sequence this is an intergenic spacer sequence this is primer binding site all those functional moieties of the genome you can mark it so that is called annotation so annotation is also important before you submit to the gen bank you know so by the way anybody can submit sequences gen bank uh, uh, provided that you have your own sequences generated by uh, rigorous empirical methodology you know so once you have that one so again that submission gen bank is optional you can retrieve related sequences from the gen bank in order to construct the phylogenetic tree so phylogenetic analysis starts from first up is multiple sequence alignment which we already discussed about and then you refine uh, this alignment and refine the contact if the assembly is problematic you need to refine the contact to make 
the assembly better. So once you have the final alignment ready, that is the input for the real analysis that starts with selection of the nucleotide model. So basically the model is an equation, so it's a complicated mathematical equation that best explains the data. Data is nothing but the uh, multiple sequence alignment, that is our data, right? So to have this data, what kind of equation that best explains this data? That is what the model is. So basically a model is mathematical equation. So we have multiple equations, you know, so which equation to choose? It's like regression. So which regression method should I choose or which uh, regression equation should I choose? So you can do a selection of the model that is called model test or model selection. And finally, once you choose this model, this equation I'm going to use, using that equation, you need to reconstruct the phylogeny by something called phylogenetic inference. Uh, for that, you can choose either discrete methods or distance-based methods. So distance-based is the old technology, but it's much more faster. So it is a good heuristics. You know, it's like first step, you know. So the distance-based method include maximum likelihood, UPGMA, uh, you know, minimum evolution. All those methods are distance-based. And a little bit more advanced is discrete character-based method, including maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian inference. These three methods are called discrete character-based phylogenetic reconstruction methods. So we have got two major kinds of phylogenetic reconstruction methods. But before you do this uh, reconstruction, you need to choose the best fitting model that I'm going to explain in uh, next module. Okay, so uh, I will introduce the models and then I will introduce which, uh, you know, which model to choose from using a test called hierarchical likelihood ratio test. HLRT test. So how do you do that? Or ML based model selection test. I will just introduce the concepts of it. And before that, first up, I told you is about the locus selection. So what are the major locus that we use it in barcoding? So as you can see, this table has got three column, loci, taxa and chromosome. So basically, uh, one of the very commonly used loci locus is ITS1, 5.8S, ITS2. So as you know, this 5.8s is uh, ribosomal, uh, uh, you know, structural, uh, you know, gene, right? It's actually coding for the structural element, 5.8 as the small subunit of the eukaryotes. Now, this ITS1 and ITS2, these are internal transcribed spacer. So these are intron, you know, so not exon. These are not coding for the gene, but 5.8s is a gene because it's coding for the structural element, though it is not really a protein. Uh, it's a ribosomal structural protein, yeah. So this particular locus is used across the eukaryote, but not prokaryote, not for any bacteria, right? For bacteria, usually we use only 16S, again, that is a ribosomal structural protein. So the gene coding for that is 16S. It's like a universal barcode for the bacteria. Any bacteria you're looking at, you can use 16S. Right. So and that is the only thing which we usually use in the DNA barcoding for the prokaryote, which is a nuclear. And of course, it doesn't make any sense. There is no nucleus for the prokaryote. Right. This is a genome is only one. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't have one the envelope. Right. There is no nuclear envelope in it. Right? There is no organelle, of course. Right. And now for the eukaryote, it is ATS1, 5.8S and ITS2. This region is used very often across animals and plants and fungus. So this is uh, probably the gold standard in uh, DNA barcoding, right? ITS uh, region. And for all eukaryotes, you can also use 18S, which is also commonly used. Uh, plants and animals, you can use 18S. For plants specifically, another very commonly used uh, G is RBCL. You see, it's a gene, I said. It's not an intron, you know. While this ITS is an intron, but RBCL codes for Rubisco large subunit. You know, you, Rubisco is a very important enzyme, uh, right? Rebulose one five bis carboxylase in uh, photosynthesis. So that's a really important enzyme, right? So it's actually 
coding for the large subunit of the Rubisco RBC L L in capital. Of course, it also have got RBC S small, but L is a lot more phylogenetically informative. This is used for the plants. Of course, it's coded by chloroplast genome. You know, circular genome inside the chloroplast organelle. It's not the nuclear one. It's a chloroplast. And in the chloroplast, there is yet another of the locus that is also quite commonly used is TRNLF intergenic spacer. So these are transfer RNA coding for L and F. L and F for leucine, you know, all these are amino acid, right? So of course, the T transfer RNA has got codon, uh, you know, a, a binding domain and it carries a one amino acid, isn't it? So that is what TRNL and F. So in between L and F, there is a spacer region, intergenic spacer, gene coding for TRNL, gene coding for TRNL. TRNF. So in between L and F, there is a spacer, and that spacer is used as a locus for phylogenetic reconstruction as well as for DNA barcoding. And this is again, it's a chloroplast encoded. It's not encoded in the the nucleus, right? Now coming to the uh, especially for the the animals and red algae. Very interesting. Red algae is so it's a plant, but red algae and animals. You know, no, not much of the connection, but cytochrome B is used. You know, COX, it's it's used very often for this uh, eukaryotes. It's coded in the mitochondrial DNA, that is maxi circle, mini circle and maxi circle, are two kinds of genome inside the mitochondria, right? So it's coded in the maxi circle of the eukaryotes, the cytochrome B. Now there is also related COX3, COX2 and ND1, cytochrome oxidase subunit 2, NADH dehydrogenase subunit 1. There is an intergenic spacer between these two adjacent genes, cytochrome oxidase subunit 3, I mean subunit 2, then spacer, then NADH dehydrogenase subunit 1. So in between, the spacer is also used very commonly for animals, right? That is also again that is coded in the maxi circle of mitochondrial, the powerhouse right the cellular powerhouse and that is why the cytochrome is involved in respiration you know so these are the, the most commonly used loci uh, in uh, for phylogenetic reconstruction as well as for dna barcoding and now how do you select so which one is it just by random for example i, I would like to work on osimum you know the the holy basil tulsi so let me decide okay let me decide because it's a planned TR and LF spacer, let me take it. Or can I take ETNS because it's also for the eukaryote? How about ITS? So how do you choose it? Which one to amplify? So is it a rational? It's completely uh, that decision. The rational decision is completely random. Or is there any rationale in choosing certain locus over the other locus? So it depends on many factors. First of all, it depends on the taxonomic level that you are looking at. Are you looking at a higher taxonomic level like for example order and class and kingdom or domain? The biggest taxonomic level is domain, isn't it? Are you looking at that big level or are you looking at really low taxonomic level like, uh, you know, like species or intraspecific diversity? So that the concept is known as tortoise and hare, the rabbit. You know, tortoise is very slow while hare is very fast, isn't it? So some locusts are, you know, tortoise because they evolve very slowly. And this is good for higher levels of uh, the, the phylogenetic reconstruction like domain or class or order. Now, some of the locusts are very fast evolving, hare rabbit like running fast right so fast evolving regions are good for lower levels you know so if you go back here you can see in general genes evolve so much slowly here as you can spot the gene cytochrome b is a gene so as rbcl is a gene these genes evolve very slowly so rbcl is very good if you are looking at a higher taxonomic level, for example, order, or ordinal phylogeny, if you want to construct, RBCL is a good option because it's a gene. It has codon and it is, uh, even though there is a degeneracy, there are a lot of constraint. 
mutations cannot freely happen in the, the gene. At the same time, mutations are a lot more tolerated if it's happening in intergenic spacer or introns because introns are not coding, right? It doesn't translate into the protein. So that is the reason that introns are fast evolving like ITS1. It's an intron, not very much fast evolving region. So this kind of uh, region, this locus is basically called hair. So this fast evolving one is good for lower level. Lower level means species level or intraspecific diversity. All those things are good for fast evolving locus. So generally ribosomal DNA loci are most conserved followed by the genes and finally introns and IGS. So if you are looking at the ribosomal, let me go back. So like 18S, 16S, these are ribosomal, you know, according for the structural unit of the ribosome, even 5.8S is ribosome. So if you are looking at, I mean, if you construct a phylogeny based on those highly conserved sequences, then it's good for higher taxonomic levels like order or uh, domain you know and then comes genes the coding dna sequence cds is coding dna sequence followed by introns and intergenic spacer like the last one which i told you this is an intergenic spacer so as trn lf intergenic spacer igs these are very fast evolving introns are also very fast evolving that's good for species level and even family level it's pretty good Another factor to consider is the amplification success. For example, the same uh, algae, uh, you know, uh, for example, hypnia. If one doesn't work, then I will definitely go for the second one. The primer, uh, even though you are doing a lot of uh, uh, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction in gradient PCR at different temperature, hot start PCR and all the varieties, annealing temperature, I change, you know, I add the magnesium. I do not add the magnesium, I change, I tweak the buffer, I add a little bit of DMSO, you know, all these things I can try to tweak the conditions of uh, my PCR in order to get a very good one band, you know, so that is what everybody want, right, after polymerase chain reaction and if you do a, a, a gel, gel electrophoresis, you know, a garros gel electrophoresis, right, so once you do that, you should get one band only or if you get two band that means the two locus got amplified which is not really good you need to cut the gel right so if you have just one band just one line in the final uh, the, the gel so that means pcr is good it worked right it might not be the case right so you will try all this condition and still it doesn't work then you will try an alternative primer you know so which primer worked so that's again, that's a chance event. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know. So is it because that you are bad in the molecular biology? No, might not be. So sometimes the primer, the sequence is not exactly same to the template DNA. Like a hypnia, uh, the hypnia is a, you know, it's a, it's a red algae. So hypnia's genome has got, of course, the sequence, right, where the primer has to bind. So if there are few slight changes, the primer cannot bind in it. So the primer needs to be redesigned, isn't it? So if you are using generic primer, then it might not even bind. And uh, while extracting the DNA, it might be having some nuclease enzyme, naturally occurring nuclease, it can degrade the template DNA, right? All those things you need to find out. So amplification success is yet another factor. Third important factor is the sequence coverage in the database. One example would be completely different field, forensics. You know, so uh, now let us say that there, there has been a rape incident somewhere and then you suspect there is a suspect in the rape, right? So then you get the suspect's DNA, you, uh, you know, the, the, the DNA that in the forensics, usually the SNPs, the genotype they will be doing, a microarray they will be doing. So once you have the genotype of this suspect, then what? So we don't have any other option, right? We cannot actually check with uh, the database, isn't it? So, or other, other option is that if there is no suspect, okay, let us consider there is no suspect. You have uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, semen sample in the spot, okay? So there is a semen sample or there is actually a, a hair follicle in the crime spot, uh, be it, uh, a, you know, a murder case, no? 
we amplified the DNA, we have the sequence with us, but with whom we have to compare, right? If we have a, a, a you know, a, a centralized criminal uh, genotype database of the repeated offenders, then we can do it. You know, we can compare it. And there is a case in most of the developed countries, like in Germany, you go Japan or Scandinavia, you know, you can compare with that centralized database to pinpoint, okay, this is a repeated offender and the same guy did the same uh, or a girl, you know, whoever, I'm not a sexist. So with in the absence of that kind of a, a centralized database, how can you actually compare? You know, that is a problem here. So something has to be there in the database in order for you to compare your sequence with that, right? The plant, an unknown plant, you just got it. I would like to identify it. So unless it is already previously identified, you can never do it, you know? So that is what, first of all, you have to actually check it. For example, Osimum, uh, which lockers should I use? So that question, the rationale should also be dependent upon available sequences in the database. So I will start, I will go to NCBI database. I will input Osimum tenui florum. That is the full uh, binomial uh, name for the uh, Tulsi. Earlier it used to be Osimum Sanctum. Now that, that name has revised into Tenui Florum, isn't it? the latest. And now if you input, then I will be clicking on to the NCBI, uh, the GenBank database. And over there, I will be looking the overview. How many sequences do they have? How many ITS have? How many 18s have? And now let us say that 18S is the most prominent and little bit of ITS, little bit of RBC, a little bit of TRN, LF spacer, little bit of RPS. Yes, that is another locus which I didn't introduce. Then I will be going with uh, whatever the most common, you know, 18S, if it's the coverage is the most, that is called sequence coverage in the database. So that is yet another important, uh, you know, factor which I should be aware of before deciding that this I should choose. You know, so homology searches work only if you have accessions to compare to. So if there is nothing there in the database, you know, what is the use of this thing, right? So you are actually comparing with something already identified, something already there, existent, right? And if it's completely new and there is nothing else to compare with, then only option for you is to generate whatever is there, not there in the database. Uh, you know, so that is a, a substantial work. You know, for example, in this one genus, there are 100 species and all the species you need to sequence it. Then only that phylogeny can work. You can uh, generate a tree, you know. So that is why that factor is also very important, though not many people are aware of it. The sequence coverage is also a very important factor to be concerned about while deciding on which locus should I choose, the first step of the phylogenetic re reconstruction.